this is Ticket Train Tuesdays. Very, um, very great to have you with us. Welcome. Um, and yeah, please do give us feedback on these sessions as we go through. Can we different presenters? Not going to be me every week. Um, so um, just tell us what you want to see. Speaking of myself every week, let me introduce myself. I'm Jeff, for those who don't know me. I'm part of the customer success team for Ticket. Um, my job is all about making sure our customers get the most out of the product, um, whether that be through product support, training, just like today, or even professional services, if you're looking for some expertise to um, to come in and, and kind of get stuff done for you. So a number of ways in which that team can help you. Uh, it all starts by you getting in touch. Um, so please reach out to us if you need anything. Help at ticket.ai is the email address to reach out to. All right. So as I said, today is mostly demo. I do have one slide um, just to kind of get us into it, talk about why this is important. I've got three reasons why knowledge and deflection is important in an ITSM practice. Um, number one is quicker response. It's about getting that quick response to that end user. Um, that's what they're looking for. If we can respond quicker, that's going to give us you know, a better result, improve that end user satisfaction. There is a caveat there, of course. There's got to be a good response. It's got to be a, uh, a value, valuable response. Quicker is not always better. Um, I'm sure you've experienced that scenario with, you know, uh, other AIs, um, particularly in customer service, when it just feels like the whole point of the AI is just to kind of push you off. Um, that's not a good experience. That's not going to improve customer satisfaction. The, um, the value comes from providing a quick but good response. And that's very important. And my second reason is less agent effort. Does anyone want to raise their hand and say that they love repeating manual tasks in their organization? They love doing the same thing over and over on, on support tickets. They love having to copy and paste. Uh, Justin's put his hand up. Great. Good to know. Um, I know what work to assign you next week. Um, yeah, they love copy and pasting the same, you know, snippet of what to do each time over and over. Um, it's frustrating as agents. It adds, you know, it, it's, it's time consuming. We want to focus on, on different stuff. Our bosses want us to be able to focus on the more complex work. So anything that we can avoid repetitive work, less effort from agents is going to be a big win for us and for the organizations we support. And therefore, number three, uh, why uh, deflections are important is we can gather correct information. So it's kind of almost like a kind of summary of the, of the first two as well, but it also goes a step further. Um, if we can make sure that we capture information up front in the ITSM process, um, that's going to be going to improve experience all around for both end users and agents. We're trying to avoid that back and forth, that email ping pong. Um, if we can get everything up front, then it means we can just go forward and resolve that issue or fulfill that request or whatever it is that's being asked of us. Um, avoid that, that, that delay that's added. We have to keep going back and ask for information, wait for them to respond, come back to us. So if we can find a way to capture all the information we need up front to ensure um, we can then deliver that, that resolution quickly and efficiently, that's great. Uh, it's good for our end users. It's good for the agents to avoid that to the back and forth frustration. Uh, and it's also really good for those high tier resources. And you're going to escalate to, they're going to want to make sure they've got everything they need. They're not going to want to have to go back and forth to the end user. So that's our third reason why deflection is important. All right, I did promise that would be it for the slide. So let me get into the demo here. Um, finding the right window.
Okay. So here we are in my um, Teams environment. Um, I'm in my fake organization known as Sandpit Incorporated. Logged in as myself. I'm an uh, I'm an end user here, and I'm in a chat with the Sandy Bot virtual agent. I'm going to be asking various things, and we've configured Ticket to be able to deflect as many requests in this scenario as we can to give us the benefit of those three points earlier. And I'll walk us through some of those examples, and then the exciting bit: we're going to go look in the back end, see how that's configured, see how that works, see how you guys set up for yourselves. Um, so hopefully you're familiar with, with the virtual agent, you're using that, you've got that deployed, I really hope you do, to your end users um, so they can log tickets. The default experience is going to be that they can just ask a question and log a ticket. The value of ticket comes when you build on top of that and start adding in that deflection process so that you don't get as many tickets logged, um, or you do, but not ones you have to deal with, and we'll see what I mean by that. So the first thing I'm going to ask of the bot is um, I need the Wi-Fi password. And bot's going to respond to us with the information. So that's just giving us back. This is the answer to your question. I've been given this information. I can now relay it back to you. And that's a scenario where we've got a quick response. The end user, they've not had to wait for an agent to actually respond to that. So that's our number one benefit coming through there. But also that hasn't required an agent to have to go and look that up or know that and type it in, or paste it in and provide the information. So that's that second uh, benefit also hit on that one. Tick gives you this feedback loop, uh, if you guys haven't seen this before, where you can specify was it helpful or not. And in this case, I'm going to put that it was. And we get this message that great, glad we could help. And that's the end of it. Uh, now, I talked about we want to minimize the number of tickets. This has actually still logged a ticket. We've been a bit sneaky here. We've implied there's no ticket logged, and that's the end of the matter. But Ticket Virtual Agent has secretly still logged a ticket, um, but that ticket is in the state of deflected. So we haven't actually reduced the number of tickets, but because it's in a state of deflected, there's no action needed on it. It doesn't go into anyone's queue. It's just there for reporting purposes. So we can actually see how good our deflection is. We can report on how many successes we're getting, uh, how many failures we're getting on deflection. We can tune our AI accordingly. We can report on return on investment um, based on how many uh, minutes of agent time we're saving, that sort of thing. Um, let me give you one more example of that. Um, we're going to do, um, we will just copy and paste. We're doing, my computer is slow. And I have deliberately put a typo in, show you that we match on these um, responses here, not based on exact keywords, based on intent, based on matching of the meaning of my phrase. And Ticket is smart enough to realize that I probably mean computer not computer, and has still presented me with the information of what to do when I've got a slow computer. So this time we've actually given our end user kind of a little things to try first sort of scenario. Um, I've gone with the classic two things, try rebooting it, and if if that's fine, then check it's plugged in. Um, um, but here I give this message. Um, if none of the above helped, please select no and log a ticket. And then this, I'm actually going to hit the second scenario where we're going to choose no. And that still allows us to log a ticket. So we get that feedback scenario. If the knowledge provided is not helpful, we can still provide our end users with a, with a route to go and log that ticket still manually. That one is going to go into our, uh, you know, a ticket that needs to be actioned and then we'll require some agent uh, interaction. Um, but we've at least eliminated. Uh, hopefully, a lot of them. And this gives the user the chance to fix their spelling mistake, of course, computer, before they submit that request. Uh, I've got a couple more, uh, one more scenario to show you as well, um, which is really going to hit on that third benefit about gathering data. So, this one I'm going to do, I need 
a new PC. And this time we're matching on the meaning of the intent that I'm looking for a new device request. So tickets worked out, I need, I'm looking for this process and it's given me the form. So we can deflect to a form, not just an article. And that's going to encourage our end user to fill in that form. And we're gathering all the information up front. What do they need? I need that in order to obviously fulfill it. Why do you need it? I need that to get through my approval process. The manager's going to want to see that. And where should we deliver it? I need that also to actually fulfill this and complete this request. I need that information. I don't want to wait till I'm ready to ship it and have to go back to the user and ask that question. I want to get all that up front. So now I've got everything I need to deliver that end to end straight through without friction, without added delay, without waiting on end users to come back to me. You will, you can build these forms out to be as complex as you need to add everything that you want to ask up front to achieve that. So that's my next example there. I'm going to submit that and create another ticket. All right. Now, I hope, I hope that's useful for you. But I also hope that a lot of you have seen that stuff before. Um, but I want to show you something a bit newer now, um, which is a new feature that came out um, just last week, um, and that is to handle a scenario that we actually had. We actually had feedback from our customers. We love feedback. Thank you very much for anyone who's ever given us feedback on the product. Um, and the feedback was that if you've got two processes that are quite similar in name then it can be very hard to ensure that the bot's going to make the right match and send the right thing. Um, and the example I've got, um, which I think is based on an actual example from a customer was, you know, around a particular uh, business application, I've got SAP in my example here, um, uh, a customer might type, an engine might type all kinds of things. But there's actually three or more very similar processes in similar in terms of wording, but very different in terms of the process. And I want to know which one it is up front so I can gather the correct information up front rather than going down the wrong path and having to back out and or missing out on that number three benefit. So in this example, I'm going to type, I have an SAP question. And I'm specifically asking something nice and vague, just like an end user would. Um, what on earth could they mean by that? And here we're seeing the new feature of Ticket, which is multi-response. So I've actually got back three items there from the bot. It's found three things it could be. All of them are a close enough match um, to my question. It's not able to know, you know, sure which one I mean. So it's going to ask the end user, well, which of these do you want? And it's giving me three. I've still got that, that backup option as well. No, I just want to create a direct ticket if none of these are appropriate. Um, and each of these can then have its own form, its own process, its own workflow behind it. And also, when you click on this to kind of drive into it, we've got a nice little feature here as well, where we actually spit out a phrase that that, that, that end user could use next time to go directly to it. So as well as getting them to the right place, we're also educating them as they go, nice and subtly, of how to shortcut next time and get straight to that thing. So if they'd have just typed this in directly, they would have got straight to the SAP fault. And now I've got my form around an SAP fault. Likewise, if I click access, I get the access request, the different areas of SAP. And if I choose configuration request, I get that third one. And each time it's spitting out that example phrase, I mean, I could type in next time to get directly to it. OK, let's take a look in the back end and see how this is configured and how you need to configure it for yourself. So here I am in uh, web.ticket.ai, the web portal for Ticket. I'm in my knowledge area here on the main navigation. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing there. Knowledge. And here are the knowledge articles that I have in play for today's demo. So here's where we started. Actually, at the bottom, these are alphabetical, that's all. Um, and I actually typed, I need the Wi-Fi password, is what I typed in. Um, so as you can see, it's not an exact match on, on phrasing, but Ticket has worked out there's a match on intent. It means the same thing, and that's why it gave me that response. Same for the uh, computer is slow. Again, that's clearly not an exact match. I don't have the typo in here, 
Plus, I don't even have my computer as slow and exact, as an exact phrase. It's made that match. But what you'll see in both cases, I have more than one phrase. And in this case, I actually have five. That's a really important piece here. If you're struggling to get good matches on your deflection, this is a very important thing to add as many phrases as you can um, to the knowledge article. You can see I can just keep adding all, add alternate phrasing and add more and more and more. Um, so make sure you're doing that if you're really struggling to get good results. And I would say probably two, two is a minimum, three or four is kind of a good goal for each article. Think of the different ways a user would phrase their question uh, if if they're looking for this end result. And that's going to help you fill those out. You know, in what different ways would a user present that to you? Um, it's matching on meaning, but so the more examples of meaning you can give it, then I have when a quick it builds question. That, yeah, great. Um, so this was in the past. I was having problems with the matching of certain things, and I was support recommended rather than using phrases to set one phrase and then use synonyms instead. Mm -hmm. Is that new with this whole setup or? I was just going to come to them. It's a great question. Um, and it really depends on the type of language. Um, so yeah, great question. I'm just raising your hand up. Sorry if I missed that. Um, I was busy um, on another screen. So please do, if you have questions, do shout out um, like Thomas did. Thank you. So I would say you want to have multiple phrases. I said three, four plus is going to be a good thing to um, to make those matches. It's going to help you get that better um, match on intent, on meaning. The exception is, and maybe this was your case, um, Thomas, is when you're when you're dealing with, you know, internal language jargon. Maybe for for uh, if that means makes sense to you, business talk, because this is built on Microsoft Azure Cognitive Services. It understands English, understands other languages as well, of course, but it doesn't understand our internal business speak and our sort of nuances and our way we phrase things. And that's where synonyms can come in. So synonyms is where we can add um, sort of internal um, language, oh. that, things that okay, mean the so same. Like I was using the name of my EMR program, right. and it has an acronym, and people have a couple other alternate names. So OK, that's the So in your case, you. synonyms was perfect, right? Because, because the natural language model that we use for Microsoft doesn't know what that system is, and it doesn't know the different internal names for that same system in with an acronym and, and not. Um, those aren't English words that it can understand the meaning of. So that's when the synonyms comes in that you can add in your own um, internal language. And what we're saying is these words all mean the same thing. You know, my example here, I've got, I've got ticket spelled ticket and ticket spelled ticket. Um, sorry if you're just listening and aren't watching, that makes no sense to you. Um, this is not an English word. So if someone types that, then, then the AI is not going to know they mean so, a ticket. So. So if I say like one of my things is I have a problem with this application application name, mm -hmm. and then I do synonyms for the application name, its acronym, and a few other names. Well, let's say see I have a problem with, and notice the synonym you know that there and swap it out. Absolutely, yeah. So when it comes to evaluate against these phrases, it'll kind of swap out all those different synonyms and and make the match that way. Yeah. So like we were first one for the SAP. If you put a SAP as a synonym for the full name of the program because someone decided to type it out. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very uh, much. Um HR system. Right. So now someone can type any of those phrases. Um I'm sorry, that's gonna take a minute to retrain my knowledge now. Um but yeah, exactly. Now I could type uh ERP. And it's going to know that I mean the same as SAP because that's how my users speak. Great question. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just about the point I was making, yeah, multiple phrases is going to give you those better, better matches. In the trouble is, is particularly with the SAP, is as you start to build up multiple phrases, my three processes, configuration request, access request, fault, as you start to build up those multiple phrases for each one, they kind of merge together, right? And you start to have a lot of overlap. And that's where before multiple response, the AI could struggle to find that correct one because you're control of you're building up enough uh, width of, of your phrasing and therefore they start to overlap with each other. So that's where the multi-response comes in. 
to um, to give you if it finds more than one good match to give you the option. And I want to in the last few minutes here show you guys where that's configured. So it's turned on by default. If you go to your bot configuration settings in Ticket, you'll see if you haven't looked here in the last week or so, um, some new settings around here around number of responses to return. So this is the new setting. These kind of three things are new uh, that you may not have seen before. Um, so the number of responses, the default is five. You can adjust it up and down as you like. Um, in terms of the number, uh, I only had three in my case. I only got the three. It's not going to send me something that's it knows is not right. Um, that's based on this traditional um, deflection score. Maximum of five. Um, you can also toggle this one on to say, if you're very confident, just give me the one, otherwise still give me responses. Um, so you can play with that one as well. And finally, the third setting is the response message to give back. So when it's when it found that multiple, you can adjust that text there uh, as you need to using this setting. So yeah, this is brand new. So go and have a look in bot configuration. Uh, you'll see it's on by default. Uh, and now you may now you may be able to adjust your phrasing as well. If you've struggled with that in the past and you've adjusted your phrasing to avoid that kind of collision, then now you can go and, and readjust knowing that if there's, there is a bit of an overlap and a user kind of hits the middle, the uh, virtual agent is going to give them the choice. All right, so we're at time. Sorry, it took a little while to get started today. Um, thank you very much for joining us.